Chapter 15. I felt I had to come up, dearie, said Miss Cornelia, and explain about that telephone. It was all a mistake. I'm sorry. Cousin Sarah isn't dead after all. Anne, smothering a smile, offered Miss Cornelia a chair on the veranda, and Susan, looking up from the collar of an of Irish crochet lace she was making for her niece, Gladys, uttered a scrupulously polite, Good evening, Mrs. Marshall Elliot. The word came out from the hospital this morning that she had passed away in the night, and I felt I ought to inform you since she was the doctor's patient. But it was another Sarah Chase, and Cousin Sarah is living and likely to live, I'm thankful to say. It's real nice and cool here, and I always say if there's a breeze to be had anywhere, it's at Ingleside. Susan and I have been enjoying the charm of this starlit evening, said Anne, laying aside the dress of pink smocked muslin she was making for Nan and clasping her hands over her knees. An excuse to be idle for a little while was not unwelcome. Neither she nor Susan had many idle moments nowadays. There was going to be a moonrise, and the prophecy of it was even lovelier than the moonrise itself would be. Tiger lilies were burning bright along the walk, and whiffs of honeysuckle went and came on the wings of the dreaming wind. Look at that wave of poppies breaking against the garden wall, Miss Cornelia. Susan and I are very proud of our poppies this year, though we hadn't a single thing to do with them. Water spilled a packet of seed there by accident. Oh, excuse me, Walter. Walter spilled a packet of seed there by accident in the spring, and this is the result. Every year, we have some delightful surprises like that. I'm partial to poppies, said Miss Cornelia, though they don't last long. They have only a day to live, admitted Anne, but how imperially, how gorgeous they live it. Isn't that better than being a stiff, horrible zinnia that lasts practically forever? We have no zinnias at Ingleside. They're the only flowers we are not friends with. Susan won't even speak to them. Anybody being murdered in the hollow, asked Miss Cornelia. Indeed, the sounds that came drifting up would seem to indicate that someone was being burned at the stake, but Anne and Susan were too accustomed to that to be dis disturbed. Persis and Kenneth have been here all day, and they wound up a ba banquet on the hollow. As for Mrs. Chase, Gilbert went to town this morning so he would know the truth about her. I am glad for everyone's sake she is doing so well. The other doctors do not agree with Gilbert's diagnosis, and he was a little worried. Sarah warned us when she went to the hospital that we were not to bury her unless we were sure she was dead, said Miss Cornelia, fanning herself majestically and wondering how the doctor's wife always managed to look so cool. You see, we were always a little afraid her husband was buried alive. He looked so lifelike, but nobody thought of it until it was too late. He was a brother of this Richard Chase who bought the old Moorside farm and moved here there from Lowbridge in the spring. He's a card. Said he came to this country to get some peace. He had to spend all his time in Lowbridge dodging widows and old maids, Miss Cornelia might have added, but did not out of regard for Susan's feelings. I've met his daughter, Stella. She comes to choir practice. We've taken quite a fancy to each other. Stella is a sweet girl, one of the few girls left that can blush. I've always loved her. Her mother and I used to be great cronies. Poor Lisette. She died young? Yes, when Stella was only eight. Richard brought Stella up himself, and him an infidel if he's anything. He says women are only important biologically, whatever that may mean. He's always shooting off some big talk like that. He doesn't seem to have made such a bad job of bringing her up, said Anne, who thought Stella Chase one of the most charming girls she'd ever met. Oh, you couldn't spoil Stella. And I'm not denying Richard had got a good deal in his headpiece. But he's a crank about young men. He's never let poor Stella have a single bow in her life. All the young men who tried to go with her, he's simply terrified out of their senses with sarcasm. He's the most sarcastic creature you ever heard of. Stella can't manage him. Her mother before her couldn't manage him. They didn't know how. He goes by contraries, but neither of them ever seemed to catch on to that. I thought Stella seemed very devoted to her father. Oh, she is. She adores him. He's almost, he is a most agreeable man when he gets his own way about everything. But he should have more sense about Stella's marrying. He must know he can't live forever, though to hear him talk, you'd think he meant to. He isn't an old man, of course. He was very young when he was married, but strokes run in that family. And what is Stella to do after he's gone? Just shrivel up, I suppose? Susan looked up from the intricate rose of her Irish crochet long enough to say decidedly, I do not hold with old folks spoiling young ones' lives in that fashion. Perhaps if Stella really cared for anyone, her father's objections might not weigh much on her. That's where you're mistaken, Anne, dearie. 
Stella would never marry any anyone her father didn't like, and I can tell you another whose life is going to be spoiled, and that's Marshall's nephew, Alden Churchill. Mary is determined he shan't marry as long as she can keep him from it. She's even more contrary than Richard. If she was a weather bank, she'd point north when the wind was south. The property is hers till Alden marries, and then it goes to him, you know. Every time he's gone about with a girl, she has contrived to put a stop to it somehow. Indeed, it is all her doing, Mrs. Marshall Elliot. Queried, oh, sorry. Indeed, is it all her doings, Mrs. Marshall Elliot? Queried Susan dryly. Some folks think that Alden is very changeable. I have heard him called a flirt. Alden is handsome and the girls chase him, retorted Miss Cornelia. I don't blame him for stringing them along a bit and dropping them when he's taught them a lesson. But there's been one or two nice girls he really liked and Mary just blocked it every time. She told me so herself. She told me she went to the Bible, she's always going to the Bible, and turned up a verse and every time it was a warning against Alden getting married. I have no patience with her and her odd ways. Why can't she go to church and be a decent creature like the rest of us around Four Winds? But no, she must set up religion for herself, consisting of going to the Bible. Last fall, when that valuable horse took sick, worth 400 if a dollar, instead of sending for the Lowbridge vet, she went to the Bible and turned up a verse. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So send for the vet she would not, and the horse died. Fancy applying that verse in such a way. And, dearie, I call it irreverent. I told her so flat, but all the answer I got was a dirty look. And she won't have the phone put in. Do you think I'm going to talk into a box on the wall? She says when anyone broaches it. Miss Cornelia paused, rather out of breath. Her sister-in-law's vagaries always made her impatient. Alden isn't at all like his mother, said Anne. Alden's like his father. A finer man never stepped as men go. Why he ever married Mary was something the Elliots could never fathom, though they were more than glad to be get her married off so well. She always had a screw loose and such a beanpole of a girl. Of course, she had lots of money. Her Aunt Mary left her everything, but that wasn't the reason. George Churchill was really in love with her. I don't know how Alden stands his mother's whims, but he's been a good son. Do you know what has occurred to me, Miss Cornelia, said Anne with an impish smile. Wouldn't it be nice if Alden and Stella should fall in love with each other? There isn't much chance of that, and they wouldn't get anywhere if they did. Mary would tear up the turf, and Richard would show a plain farmer the door in a minute, even if he is a farmer himself now. But Stella isn't the kind of girl Alden fancies. He likes the high-colored laughing ones, and Stella wouldn't care for his type. I did hear the new minister at Lowbridge was making sheep's eyes at her. Isn't he rather anemic and short-sighted, asked Anne. And his eyes bulge, said Susan. They must be dreadful when he tries to look sentimental. At least he's a Presbyterian, said Miss Cornelia, as if that atoned for much. Well, I must be going. I find if I'm out in the dew much, my neuralgia pr troubles me. I'll walk down to the gate with you. You always looked like a queen in that dress, Anne, dearie, said Miss Cornelia, admiringly and irrelevantly. Anne met Owen and Leslie Ford at the gate and brought them back to the veranda. Susan had vanished to get lemonade for the doctor, who had just arrived home, and the children came swarming up from the hollow, sleepy and happy. You were making dreadful noise as I drove in, said Gilbert. The whole countryside must have heard you. Persis Ford, shaking back her thick, honey-tinted curls, stuck out her tongue at him. Persis was a great favorite with Uncle Gil. We were just imitating howling dervishes, so of course we had to howl explained Kenneth. Look at the state your blouse is in, said Leslie rather severely. I fell in Di's mud pie, said Kenneth, which decided satisfaction in his tone. He loathed those starched spotless blouses mother made him wear when he came up to the glen. Mother dearums, said Jem, can I have those old ostrich feathers in the garret to sew in the back of my pants for a tail? We're going to have a circus tomorrow and I'm going to be the ostrich and we're going to get an elephant. Do you know that it costs Six hundred dollars a year to feed an elephant, said Gilbert solemnly. An imaginary elephant doesn't cost anything, explained Jem patiently. Anne laughed. We never need to be economical in our imaginations, thank heavens. Walter said nothing. He was a little tired and quite content to sit down beside Mother on the steps and lean his black head against her shoulder. Leslie Ford, looking at him, thought he, that he had the face of a genius the remote, detached look of a soul from another star. Earth was not his habitat. Everybody was very happy in this golden hour of a golden day. 
A bell in a church across the harbor rang faintly and sweetly. The moon was making patterns on the water. The dunes shimmered in hazy silver. There was a tang of mint in the air, and some unseen roses were unbearably sweet. And Anne, looking dreamily over the lawn with eyes that in spite of six children were still very young, though thought there was nothing in the world so slim and elfin as a very young Lombardy poplar by moonlight. Then she began to think about Stella Chase and Alden Churchill, until Gilbert offered her a penny for her thoughts. I'm thinking seriously of trying my hand at matchmaking, retorted Anne. Gilbert looked at the others in mock despair. I was afraid it would break out again some day. I've done my best, but you can't reform a born matchmaker. She has a positive passion for it. The number of matches she has made is incredible. I couldn't sleep of the nights if I had such responsibilities on my conscience. But they're all happy, protested Anne. I'm really an adept. Think of all the matches I've made or been accused of making. Theodora Dix and Ludovic Speed, Stephen Clark and Prissy Gardner, Janet Sweet and John Douglas, Professor Carter and Esme Taylor, Nora and Jim, and Dovey and Jarvis. Oh, I admit it, this wife of mine, Owen, has never lost her sense of expectation. Thistles may, for her, bear figs at any time. I suppose she'll keep on trying to marry people off until she grows up. I think she had something to do with another match yet, said Owen, smiling at his wife. Not I said Anne promptly. Blame Gilbert for that. I did my best to persuade him not to have that operation performed on George Moore. Talk about sleeping on nights. There are nights when I wake up in a cold perspiration dreaming that I succeeded. Well, they say it is only happy women who match make, so that is one up for me, said Gilbert complacently. What new victims have you in mind now, Anne? Anne only grinned at him. Matchmaking is something requiring subtlety and discretion, and there are things you do not tell even to your husband. Chapter 16. Anne lay awake for hours that night and several nights thereafter thinking about Alden and Stella. She had a feeling that Stella thought longingly about marriage, a home, babies. She had begged one night to be allowed to give Rilla her bath. It's so delightful to bathe her plump, dimpled little body. And again, shyly, it's so lovely, Mrs. Blythe, to have little darling velvet arms stretched out to you. Babies are so right, aren't they? It would be a shame if a grouchy father should prevent the blossoming of those secret hopes. It would be an ideal marriage, but how could it be brought about with everybody concerned, a bit stubborn and contrary? For the stubbornness and contrariness were not on all the old folks' side. Anne suspected that both Alden and Stella had a streak of it. This required an entirely different technique from any previous affair. In the nick of time, Anne remembered Dobie's father. Anne tilted her chin and went at it. Alden and Stella, she considered, were as good as married from that hour. There was no time to be lost. Alden, who lived at the Harbor Head and went to the Anglican Church over the harbor, had not even met Stella Chase as yet. Perhaps not even seen her. He had not been dangling after any girl for some months, but he might begin at any moment. Mrs. Janet Swift of the Upper Glen had a very handsome niece visiting her, and Alden was always after the new girls. The first thing to do then was to have Alden and Stella meet. How is this to be managed? It must be brought about in some way absolutely innocent in appearance. Anne racked her brains and could think of nothing more original than giving a party and inviting them both. She did not altogether like the idea. It was hot weather for a party and the Four Winds young people were such romps. Anne knew Susan would never consent to a party without practically house cleaning Ingleside from attic to cellar and Susan was feeling the heat this summer. But a good cause demands sacrifices. Jen Pringle, B.A., had written that she was coming for a long-promised visit to Ingleside, and that would be the very excuse for a party. Luck seemed to be on her side. Jen came. The invitations were sent out. Susan gave Ingleside its overhauling. She and Anne did all the cooking for the party themselves in the heat of a heat wave. Excuse me. <laughs> that was redundant. In the heart of a heat wave. Anne was woefully tired the night before the party. The heat had been terrible. Jem was sick in bed with an attack of what Anne secretly feared was appendicitis, though Gilbert lightly dismissed it as only green apples. And the shrimp had been nearly scalded to death when Jen Pringle, trying to help Susan, knocked a pan of hot water off the stove on him. Every bone in Anne's body ached. Her head ached, her feet ached, her eyes ached. Jen had gone with a group of young fried to see the lighthouse, telling Anne to go right to bed, but instead of going to bed, she sat about on the veranda in the dampness that followed the afternoon's thunderstorm and talked to Alden Churchill, who had called to get some medicine for his mother's bronchitis, but would not go into the house. 
Anne thought it was a heaven-sent opportunity, for she wanted very much to have a talk with him. They were quite good friends, since Alden often called on a similar errand. Alden sat on the veranda step with his bare head thrown back against the post. He was, as Anne always thought, a very handsome fellow, tall and broad-shouldered, with a marble-white face that never tanned, vivid blue eyes, and a stiff, upstanding brush of inky black hair. He had a laughing voice and a nice deferential way which women of all ages liked. He had gone to Queens for three years and the thought of going to Redmond, but his mother refused to let him go, alleging biblical reasons, and Alden had settled down contentedly enough on the farm. He liked farming. He had told Anne. It was free, out of doors, independent work. He had his mother's knack of making money and his father's attractive personality. It was no wonder he was considered something of a matrimonial prize. Alden, I want to ask a favor of you, said Anne winningly. Will you do it for me? Sure, Mrs. Blythe, he answered heartily. Just name it. You'd know I'd do anything for you. Alden was really very fond of Mrs. Blythe and would really have done a good deal for her. I'm afraid it will bore you, said Anne anxiously, but it's just this. I want you to see that Stella Chase has a good time at my party tomorrow night. I'm so afraid she won't. She doesn't know many young people around here yet. Most of them are younger than she is. At least the boys are. Ask her to dance and see that she isn't left alone and out of things. She's so shy with strangers. I do want her to have a good time. Oh, I'll do my best, said Aunt Alden readily. But you mustn't fall in love with her, you know, warned Anne, laughing carefully. Have a heart, Mrs. Blythe. Why not? Well, confidentially, I think Mr. Paxson of Lowbridge has taken quite a fancy to her. That conceited young coxcomb, exploded Alden with unexpected warmth. Anne looked mild rebuke. Why, Alden, I'm told he's a very nice young man. It's only that kind of man who would have any chance of Stella's father, you know. That's so, said Alden, relapsing into his indifference. Yes, and I don't know if even he would. I understand Mr. Chase thinks there is nobody good enough for Stella. I'm afraid a plain farmer wouldn't have a look in, so I don't want you to make trouble for yourself falling in love with a girl you could never get. I'm just dropping a friendly warning. I'm sure your mother would think as I do. Oh, thanks. What sort of girl is she, anyhow? Looks good? Well, I admit she isn't a beauty. I like Stella very much, but she's a little pale and retiring. Not overly strong, but I'm told Mr. Paxson has money of his own. To my thinking, it should be an ideal match, and I don't want anyone to spoil it. Why didn't you invite Mr. Paxson to your spree and tell him to give your Stella a good time, demanded Alden rather truculently. <laughs> Anyway, you know, a minister wouldn't come to a dance, Alden. Now, don't be cranky and do see that Stella has a nice time. Oh, I'll see that she has a rip-roaring time. Good night, Mrs. Blythe. Alden swung off abruptly, left alone, and laughed. Now, if I know anything of human nature, that boy will sell right into the show the world he can get Stella if he wants her in spite of anybody. He rose right to my bait about the minister, but I suppose I'm in for a bad night with this headache. She had had a bad night, complicated by what Susan called a crick in the neck, and felt about as brilliant as gray flannel in the morning. But in the evening, she was as gay and gal she was a gay and gallant hostess. The party was a success. Everybody seemed to have a good time. Stella certainly had. Alden saw to that almost too zealously for good form, Anne thought. It was going a bit strong for a first meeting that Alden should whisk Stella off to a dim corner of the veranda after supper and keep her there for an hour. But on the whole, Anne was satisfied when, the, when she thought things over the next morning. To be sure, the dining room carpet has been practically ruined by two spilled saucerfuls of ice cream and a plateful of cake being ground into it. Gilbert's grandmother's Bristol glass candlesticks had been smashed to smithereens. Somebody had upset a pitcher full of rainwater in the spare room, which had soaked down and discolored the library ceiling in a tragic fashion. The tassels were half torn off the Chesterfield. Susan's big Boston fern, the pride of her heart, had apparently been sat upon by some large and heavy person. But on the credit side of the ledger was the fact that unless all signs failed, Alden had fallen for Stella. Anne thought the balance was in her favor. Local gossip within the next few weeks confirmed this view. It became increasingly evident that Alden was hooked. But what about Stella? Anne did not think Stella was the sort of girl to fall too ripely into any man's outstretched hand. She had a spice of her father's contrariness, which in her worked out as a charming independence. Again, luck befriended a worried matchmaker. 
Stella came to see the Ingleside Delphiniums one evening and afterwards they sat on the veranda and talked. Stella Chase was a pale, slender thing, rather shy, but intensely sweet. She had a soft cloud of pale gold hair and wood brown eyes. Anne thought it was her eyelashes did the trick for she was not really pretty. They were unbelievably long and when she lifted them and dropped them, it did things to masculine hearts. She had a certain distinction of manner, which made her seem a little older than her 24 years, and a nose that might be decidedly aquiline in later lives. In later life. I've been hearing things about you, Stella, said Anne, shaking a finger at her, and I don't know if I liked them. Will you forgive me for saying that I wonder if Alden Churchill is just the right beau for you? Stella turned a startled face. What? I thought you liked Alden, Mrs. Blythe. I do like him, but well, you see, he has the reputation of being very fickle. I'm told no girl can hold him long. A good many have tried and failed. I'd hate to see you left like that if his fancy veered. I think you are mistaken about Alden, Mrs. Blythe, said Stella slowly. I hope so, Stella, if he were a different type now, bouncing and jolly like Eileen Swift. Oh well, I must be going home, said Stella vaguely. Father will be lonely. When she had gone, Anne laughed again. I rather think Stella has gone away secretly vowing that she will show meddlesome friends that she can hold Alden and that no Eileen Swift shall ever get her claws on him. That little toss of her head and that sudden flush on her cheeks told me that. So much for the young folks. I'm afraid the older ones will be tougher nuts to crack.